So today we'll be continuing our sermon from last week called Handling Persecution, and this is going to be part two. And we are studying the topic of persecution because we actually meet uh, the church's first persecution in Acts chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 4, uh, the fourth book of the New Testament, kind of towards the middle end of the Bible, I could say. And uh, remember that the book of Acts is the record of the life and the times of the early church. So in the book of Acts, we get uh, the birth of the church. We also get the years of growth and how the gospel was spread throughout the world. And as the church erupted into the scene, there was a certain reaction from the crowd, obviously. And Jesus says in John chapter 15 that he says to his disciples, Don't, do not be surprised that if the world hates me, they hated, uh, the whole world hates you, sorry, they hated me first. And so we said last time that persecution for the Christian is inevitable. And we're about to see it for the first time in the church. Now, if you recall, Acts chapter 2 that we've been studying is the birth of the church where we get the Holy Spirit coming down during the Feast of Pentecost. And then Peter decides to preach about the, the miracle that happened. And he preaches a sermon in Acts chapter 2. And then he preaches another sermon in Acts chapter 3. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 4 now, which is where we are, then verse 4 of Acts chapter 4 tells us that there was about a number of men of 5,000. So this is not counting women and children. So you can probably estimate possibly 10,000 more people coming in. And so at this time, if we add this amount from Acts chapter 4, verse 4 with the previous, then there could be around 20,000 people involved in the church. That's, that's humongous. And so the Jewish leaders tried to get rid of Jesus by killing Jesus. But now they're having to deal with all these people kind of running around, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, that this man from Nazareth rose from the dead. And so they're pretty scared. Hence why we see that opposition would occur naturally. And in many ways, in this case, it was politically and religious opposition and persecution. Now remember at this point that in Acts chapter 4, or 3, sorry, but now we're in 4, that uh, Peter and John are coming into the temple during the evening prayer hour, and they heal a lame man at the beautiful gate, and this man is a really well-known man, probably around the age of 40 years old or, or more. And after this healing, the man basically jumps right up and follows Peter and John into the temple. And they use the occasion and walk to Solomon's portico, which is this colonnade in the temple. And they begin to preach with this man right in the middle of them. And they preached the gospel message. And we just said earlier, as a result of Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 4, that 5,000 men were saved. But in response to the sermon that Peter is preaching, then there was a great resentment from the religious leaders at that time. Because they heard and they saw what happened. And so they begin to persecute Peter and John. And in this case, or in this sense right here, they begin to persecute them physically. And you may be thinking, you know what? In today's society as a Christian, um, I'm not really getting physically persecuted. So how does this uh, passage of scripture apply to me? Well, we said last time that persecution looks a little bit different, especially in America today, right? Where Satan works in a more subtle way now. He approaches persecution that addresses our ego. It addresses our status. It addresses our pride. It, it's not really attacking our body anymore, but it hits in the area where it affects who we are personally, doesn't it? It makes us question, do we really want to get persecuted because people might look at me as like a fool, right? And so there's this fear of losing this position or this reputation in our community or in our society, society. And so Satan pushes this fear upon those who are Christians into which we, we get this fear and we tend to back off when it comes to the proclamation of his holy name. 
And so there's this fear of people not liking you, this fear of people, people thinking you're a fool, or there's this fear of people um, or of you actually losing your job. That, uh, just this week, there's been all these articles that's been coming up, and uh, there was this article that popped up in all my news feeds and everything that I, I kind of follow of a gym teacher that was put on leave because he was refusing to use the pre preferred pronouns for transgender students. His name is Brian Tanner Cross. He actually gave a speech during a school board meeting, and he says he refuses to use these transgender pronouns in his class. And he says this, quote, I'm a teacher, but I serve God first, and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa because it's against my religion, unquote. Well, it turns out that after that, he was put on administrative leave. And he doesn't know when he's going to come back to his job. And his wife says that at least they could have said goodbye to their students because they were persecuted for holding on to their Christian faith. Now, another video surfaced this past week of a Portland, Oregon teachers council and I was watching the zoom meeting and this person was leading uh, all these teachers about like I would say 20 teachers and she basically said that if you do not teach critical race theory then you're going to get fired and so in the video she says quote come to the light you, you must evolve or dissolve and she's talking about evolve and teach about racism and everything that they do and this is a public school council of our K through 12 system and so we live in a Biden American today that says if you don't or if you're not with us, then away with you. And this is the first time in my uh, young life that I'm actually seeing uh, persecution come from the federal level. I've never seen it in this kind before. But one way or another, a true Christian who confronts the world of sin and repentance and salvation only through Christ. When you are a true Christian that does that, what happens? They will obviously react to what you say. And so Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you want to live a godly life in Jesus Christ? I think as Christians we would say, of course. Then of course you're going to get persecuted, Paul says. Philippians 1.29 says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but listen to this, but also to suffer on his behalf. So it is a simple Christian fact that being a Christian brings upon persecution. And it's a natural response to Christians that those who live out the Christian faith will get persecuted. So it's a measure of your commitment to the Christian faith that brings persecution or not, how committed you really are. Now, since we're on the topic of persecution, I want to actually kind of digress a little bit, but still on the topic, and I want to give you the positives of persecution, because I think many times when we think about persecution, there's like a very, a very negative light to it, right? Like, like let's all avoid persecution because uh, it hurts us, it, it, it makes, discourages us, but I want to actually persuade you guys that Christian persecution is a positive thing, and you're going to see all positives and zero negatives. So I'm going to try to quickly go through this, okay? The first positive to persecution is that Christian persecution brings maturity. It brings maturity. Listen to the way James says it in James chapter 1 verse 2. James says this, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Did you guys know that it is part of God's will for you to be perfect. Did you know that? I just recently heard a sermon that the pastor says that you cannot, God doesn't want you to be perfect. That's actually wrong because in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The plan of God for a Christian is that you be perfected. Now we obviously know we can't be perfected, but it means to strive for perfection in one way or another, right? And so another way to say to be perfected is to say mature. 
You need to mature. Well, what begins the path of maturity? Well, number one, the, the path to maturity is obviously the Word of God. In 1 Peter 2.2, it says, As newborn baby, babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow. So obviously we know that the Word of God is the food that we intake to grow. But number two, the, uh, to maturity, the way you grow, is James says trials. He says trials creates endurance. It perfects you. And what does trials mean? Well, obviously trials means trials. It means persecution. It means sufferings. It means problems, etc., etc. And it's these two things, the Word of God, and these trials that actually brings a Christian to maturity. And that is why, my friends, you should not avoid persecution. Instead, you need to allow the persecution to come to you as part of your spiritual growth. And as you grow, you're going to be confronting the people of Christ. And therefore, when you're confronting the people of Christ, obviously, you're going to meet persecution, which will result in your spiritual maturity. And James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials. Now, the positive number two, persecution brings a reward. Now listen to the way that Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Listen, he says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Now, remember, this is Peter. This is someone who knows persecution very well. We're talking about Peter in Acts chapter 4. And Peter says this, If you're being punished for your sins, that, that, that's, there's nothing to it, right? That's just punishment. That's not persecution. But if you are being punished for your preaching of the gospel, then in that, there is glory, right? There is this favor with God. That you suffer for it and you patiently endure it for the sake of Christ. And that brings you glory and that brings him glory. And so that's why in verse 21 he says, For you have been called for this purpose. For what purpose? For suffering for Christ. Did you guys know you were called for that if you were a Christian? Now, a lot of people have misunderstood this verse. They've kind of twisted this around a little bit. Where they purposely caused themselves Sufferings, And you may have seen this before where in, in Europe there's some people where they're called flagellants where they have these little uh, ropes with the ends of with glass and they kind of just walk around kind of whipping themselves and, and uh, they, they, they just kind of scar their whole back until it's all bloody walking around as if they do it in the name of Christ. It's, it's quite weird. And, but they actually think that this, is, this brings glory when you suffer on purpose. Is that what the Bible says? Of course not, right? It's not saying that there's this self-gratification suffering that brings the glory to God. No, but rather, this is the kind of suffering that you suffer when you, as a result of you confronting the world of the gospel message. When you bring up Christ to someone and you suffer for it, that actually finds favor with the Lord. And any kind of suffering that's actually independent of the gospel is ridiculous. And some people may say, you know what, the cross I bear is my husband, or the, the, son, the sons and daughters that I have is the, throne, the, the, the thorns in my flesh. No, that's just regular problems that we all have, right? We all have our own problems. That is not the suffering that pleases God. You cannot ever say that, even though your husband or wife may be horrible. That's not the issue, okay? The issue is this. The suffering that actually pleases God is the suffering that comes from your faithfulness in doing the mission of God, which is the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ, discipling one another in the faith, right? And so the persecution that comes as a result of your active and your aggressive life of being an actual Christian in the world will bring glory to you and to God and that is a great reward and yes you may get pushback but the reward is you get the glory you see that you get to taste the glory of God so you want to experience the glory of God I hope you guys all do I do you do right and therefore bring on the persecution that's what that's what the Bible says 
In 1 Peter 1.24, Peter actually says the glory of man is like the flower of grass. The glory of man is like the flower of grass. What is Peter trying to say? He's saying this. The glory of man. What is that? He says, if you decide to saturate yourself with the culture, if you accommodate to the society, if you compromise to the, for the sake of your neighbor, all that, you actually may result in man's glory, right? You actually might be a friend to everyone, and they may praise you, and you may get accolades, and you may get to places. But all that glory is a result of a temporary glory that fades away like grass. That's what Peter's trying to say. So persecution is different because you get God's glory. You want God's glory, which is an eternal glory. So that's why persecution is wonderful. It brings glory. It brings maturity. It brings a reward. The third positive is persecution brings dependency. It brings dependency on God. Now listen to how Paul says it. He says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a very popular verse. God, uh, Paul is pleading with God to take away his suffering. There's a thorn in his flesh. And Paul says in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. So God replies to Paul's plea. And God says, you know what? I like you weak, Paul. I like you weak because you actually lean on me when you're weak. And so Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Verse 10, Therefore, I delight in weaknesses and insults and distresses in persecutions and difficulties in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am made strong. Man, Paul just says, I, I like it. See, I, I really enjoy persecution. Why? Because when I am weak in persecution, I'm actually made strong in Christ. I lean on Christ. Because persecution would push, will push a person to the edge of their seat. And when you realize you're incapable, that's when you realize you need to lean on God even more. Now, the last positive I want to talk about, which if you may know, there's, there's a lot of these kind of different positives inside of it, but I'm not really speaking too much on it, is that persecution, and this one's really important, persecution identifies you with Christ. Persecution identifies you with Christ. And a good way to kind of keep track of all these persecutions is on the sermon recap, okay? So you can look on that. But I want to read to you guys Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Follow with me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. I'm going to read this a little slower because it's kind of hard to understand, okay? Paul says this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions on behalf of his body, which is his church. Now I want you to see this because you've probably never heard of persecution in this way before. Since the time of Jesus, they've been persecuting Jesus, and they've never stopped. The world today hates Jesus Christ, don't they? They hate him. And do you know what the world hates about you and I as Christians? What do they hate? They don't hate you and I. They don't hate us. They hate the Jesus in us, don't they? They hate the Christ in us. So when we are persecuted, who is really being persecuted? Jesus. It's not us. It's Jesus. They don't know us. I could be, be uh, proclaiming Christ everywhere I go. The world may be attacking me, and they don't even understand that. If they got to know me on a personal level, I might actually be a really nice guy, right? Yeah, so they don't, that, I'm not that bad. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a rapist. I'm not anybody who's doing anything wrong. But they still might get angry at me. But who are they really after? They are really after Jesus, aren't they? They're after the Jesus that we preach. And so they killed him when he was alive. And they're still trying to kill him. Because there will always be people that persecute Jesus Christ. So when the Christians are being persecuted, they are really standing in the place of Christ, getting what is actually directed at him. But the problem is this. Jesus is not around anymore, right? He's not around anymore, so who, gets, who actually gets it? It's us. 
We get it, don't we? And that's exactly what Paul is trying to say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, which I just read. He says this, I fill up my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And so the mindset that Paul has and that you and I should have is this. Our Lord has suffered so much for me, right? What else can I do but suffer for him then? I mean, he died for me. The least I can do is take a few arrows at, you know, at me, right? That's, what, that's all it takes. And Paul just really, really loves Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 1.5, the afflictions of Christ overflowed towards us. The world is always trying to kill Jesus Christ, but they just can't get to him. They just keep getting to me, right? That's the thing. So therefore, I represent Christ, and since I keep getting what they mean for him, then Paul says, oh, what a joy that really is, right? Oh, what a joy that they actually target Christ, but they hit me. And so Paul continues in Philippians 3.10, Oh, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. See, I get to share in the fellowship of Christ and I get to share in Jesus' suffering. Oh, what a great joy that really is, isn't it? So what persecution may sound like, it may sound really negative, but notice it's all positives. Persecution produces maturity, it produces glory, it produces reward, it produces joy, blessing, salvation. It produces the privilege of being identified with Christ's sufferings. Now, maybe you don't love Jesus enough to want all that, but Paul sure did, didn't he? And you know who else did? Peter and John. And we get to see that in Acts chapter 4. Now, that's just an introduction. But you may be thinking to yourself, man, I've never seen persecution in that way before, Pastor. And that's good, because you should start seeing it that way. It is a wonderful opportunity to see all the blessings that comes with the persecution for Christ. But this passage specifically deals with that once you're in the persecution now, because we understand what persecution is, then how do you handle persecution? And there are seven principles to handling persecution. This is all review still. The first one is to submit to it. And we see that in verses 1 through 7, that Peter and John come in the middle of the Hall of Hewn Stone, and they are questioned by the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish council. And we didn't see them fighting or them resisting of any, of any kind, right? And so why aren't they doing that? Because their mindset is different. They're thinking to themselves, you know what? I've been obedient this whole time. I've been preaching the gospel. I've been listening to everything that Jesus has, has been saying. Then let's just see where Jesus takes me. And therefore, when persecution came to them, they submitted to it. And if you're obedient to God, this is the principle that we, we, we were teaching last time. If you're obedient to God and God brings on the persecution, then may God bring you all the way through to it, right? May you just say to yourself, you know what, I'm doing what God wants me to do. He wants me here for a certain reason. I'm just going to submit to it. I'm not going to fight it, and I'm just going to be submissive. Principle number two of handling persecution is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So you get into a situation that God has brought you in, you better depend on God. That's what the filling of the Holy Spirit means. You, you are just basically allowing God to speak for you because you've been obedient this whole time. And therefore, we see Peter and John, they are simply yielding to the Holy Spirit. And that in itself is a victory, right? When you yield to the Holy Spirit, He will guide you through. They didn't manpower their way through with their cunning, clever speech. Instead, they just yielded to the Holy Spirit. No human techniques at all. The third principle, they seized the opportunity. They seized the opportunity. When they got into the situation, they saw it as an opportunity to preach Christ. And remember we said last time that they would have never got the opportunity to stand in front of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, unless, <coughs> excuse me, unless it was through persecution. 
And it would have been easy for them to simply just say during the question, you know what, let's just keep quiet because uh, we, we, we need to keep doing our mission, right? How are we going to preach to the world if we were stopped right here? Let's, let's just keep quiet. But instead, they were strong and courageous and they saw it as an opportunity. And you should note that Peter and John didn't really have like a historical preference to this. Do you know what I mean? They, they didn't see anybody before then. This is the first time in human history that the church is being persecuted. This is brand new stuff to them. So then too was actually the path, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they were the path setters. They set the path for the other believers to see how they were to, supposed to deal with persecution. <clears throat> and so Peter and John simply said, you know what, we're here. We don't really know what to do. We're obedient. Let's just do it. Let's do it. Let's just preach the gospel. And off they went. In verse 8 through 13 of Acts chapter 4, of Acts chapter 4 we see it, right? We see Peter preaching in front of the Sanhedrin. He preaches Christ. He places every single thing in front of them. He indicts the Jewish leaders that you guys are the ones that killed your Messiah that you've been waiting for your entire life. That's a very bold statement in the face of the highest court in the Jewish lands. Very bold. So coming to the new verses now, okay? <clears throat> so let's take a look at our Bibles. What is the reaction from Peter's sermon? He just laid it all out there very courageously. What is the response? Verse 13 says this. <clears throat> now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And we, saw, we, read, uh, we learned about this a little bit last time, right? The Sanhedrin, these, these PhD theologians, right? These high priests, they looked at Peter and John and they said, you know what, these guys didn't even go to rabbinical schools. They're not even theologians. They're not groomed in Jewish theology. Who are these lowlifes, right? These are amateurs right here. We're the pros. And verse 13 <clears throat> actually says this. They were amazed. They were beside themselves. I mean, how do you explain these two unlearned nobodies able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us Jewish councils? And they're coming on top. They're just preaching. They're expositing the scriptures. They're just telling them, don't you know this? Don't you know this? And it's like saying to them, you got two high school students coming to argue with PhD professors. Who are you? How do you know all this? You guys are just from Galilee, which is nobody's. And then verse 13, which is pretty interesting, it says this. <clears throat> they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Now, what does this mean? We should not spiritualize this verse, okay? There's nothing mystical about it. It simply means this. What Peter and John were doing reminded them of Jesus Christ. Because this was exactly what Jesus was doing. What do you mean? Well, remember the thing that shocked the Jews, especially the Sanhedrin the most, was that Jesus was teaching as if one having what? Authority. They said he taught them as one having authority authority and when they looked at Jesus they thought the same thing didn't they they said who is this guy he didn't go to the rabbi schools with us none of us rabbis has anointed him to be a rabbi he didn't go through the regular process to be a rabbi in fact they used that against him can anything good come from Nazareth he's a lowlife isn't this the carpenter's son they said and not only that, what else did Peter and John do that reminded them of Jesus? They just did a miracle, right? They just did a miracle. And what did Jesus do all the time during his ministries? Miracles to the thousands, to the hundreds of thousands possibly. Plus, Peter and John preached the Old Testament in which Jesus preached it all the time, quoting it back and forth, back and forth to the people that knew the Scriptures. And so Peter and John was doing the same exact thing that Jesus was doing when he was on earth. 
because he did, they did it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So they spoke with authority. They did all these miracles, and they interpreted the Old Testament just like our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're thinking to themselves, these guys are connected to Jesus Christ. So here we go again, right? We got the same problem all over again. And of course they're not equal to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that. But the, the message and the miracle were equal to Jesus Christ. Why? Because it was Jesus Christ working through them for a purpose. And in that case, they took notice of it then. Because it looked just like Jesus then. And now we come to the fourth principle. Okay, the fourth principle. This is a new principle, so I'll slow down a little bit. And this one is obey at all costs. Obey at all costs. When you are handling persecution, you need to obey at all costs. And we're going to be looking at verse 14. <clears throat> and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Now, what can they say? The guy is standing right in front of them, right? This is the guy that everyone knows, and he's healed. So what are they going to say? This is the blindness of sin. Right? This is the blindness. They were face to face with the power of God, and they blindly just shut their eyes. John chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says, People loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. See, the Sanhedrin, they know the truth. They, they, don't, they know it. They know all, everything that's happened before. They know they killed Jesus Christ. And they know the guy's right there. They know this is a miracle. But what do we see? They are trying to avoid it at all costs. This is the character of unbelief. In the face of absolute evidence, unbelief rejects it, right? They just simply reject it because of pride, because of unbelief, because they can't understand. And we hear this all the time. I'll believe God if he does a trick. I'll believe God if he does a miracle. I'll believe God if I hear some kind of sign or he's, he shows me something. Do you guys remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? That's a really good parable, by the way. And what happens when the rich man goes to hell and he sees Abraham? What does he say to Abraham? He says this, I want to go home and tell my brothers so they won't come here. Now, what does Abraham respond to this rich man? He says this, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Did you guys, do you guys know that someone actually raised from the dead, especially at this point right here? Yet they still do not believe. Now listen, it's not a miracle that brings people to believe. You have to understand that. It's not a miracle or a sign or, or God speaking to you that brings your faith. It's the brokenness of the Spirit. It's the conviction of sin. It's the knowledge of truth that brings someone into the faith. Miracles are simply signs. Them alone can never bring someone to faith. Just think about Jesus' life, right? Thousands of miracles. Only 12, 12 of them, 11 at that time, right? Believed, and they barely believed. They left when he died. A miracle cannot bring you to faith. Verse 15. But when they had ordered them to lead the council, they began to confer with one another. So they had this little side meeting, right? Like, let's do a break because we don't know what to do and let's talk about it and then we'll bring you guys back in. And what do they say? Well, verse 16 says, saying, What shall we do with these men for the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in in Jerusalem, comma, and we cannot deny it. See, that's a really, really dumb question, right? Because they actually know that Peter and John do not deserve any kind of punishment. They don't deserve the jail time that they did earlier. They don't deserve any of this. 
And they all noted that you have to, you have to just read the text, right? They all just really conferred with one another that, yeah, there, there, a miracle actually took place. There was a miracle. The man's standing right there. And they can't deny it. The whole city of Jerusalem knows it. But yet, listen, they had the intention to reject it. They just, inside their heart, they're like, we cannot allow it to be confirmed, right? We can't confirm it as a Jewish council. We got to get rid of these people still, even though this miracle happened. This is a great example of a, the darkness of sin and how deep you can go. The character of unbelief at its truest sense right here. They were trying to find justification. You know, there's no law in the Jewish law that says that you can't do a miracle. There's no law that for forbids good deeds, right? So what are they going to do? What, what kind of law are they going to place in front of John and Peter to indict them? And they had another issue at hand. The problem was that Peter and John, they looked like heroes all of a sudden, right? Everyone in Jerusalem's like, woohoo, we know that guy for 40 years now, and you guys healed him, and this guy's dancing around, and, and they just praise the Lord for that. And so Peter and John were heroes to these people because they just healed this lame man that everyone knew. So it would have been really bad if the leaders of the Jews came and came to a consensus to punish the heroes of the city of Jerusalem all of a sudden. Where everyone just said, praise the Lord because this guy is healed. And all of a sudden our leaders are punishing them for what we praise. And so they, were, they, they had to find some kind of middle ground, but they were between a, hard, the rock, a rock and a hard place all of a sudden, right? And they needed to do something without stirring the people to riot against them. So what do they do? Verse 17. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. Basically, let's just place our authority over them, right? Let's use our authority, utilize it upon them, and let's threaten them. Verse 18. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They commanded them to never speak the name of Jesus, never preach, never, this word speak here is publicly speak in any way. Basically, there was a preaching ban from the religious government at that time. Dr. Dr. John MacArthur says, quote, Isn't it an interesting thing that the early church had to be commanded to be quiet and the modern church has to be commanded to speak? Times have really changed, right? They were commanded not to speak. We are commanding people to speak today. They really wanted to get rid of Jesus. They hated Jesus. Even today, it's really interesting. They, they still can't get rid of Jesus. It must have been so strange that... They thought that killing this man, Jesus, would get rid of Jesus. But it obviously didn't because all of a sudden there's 20,000 people walking around proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and also proclaiming that he's alive. And that's a little scary because we killed him, didn't we? But he's alive. And this is the message of the gospel. And even today people are trying to get rid of Jesus. The Bible used to be part of public education. Did you guys know that? Until Darwinian theory just blew it all out. Even if you go to Israel today, which is the center of Judaism, Jesus is everywhere. It's kind of crazy because like, if you imagine yourself as a non-believing Jew, non-believing in Jesus Christ, every single day if you lived in Jerusalem, you see a busloads of people Tourists coming into Israel trying to look at the places of Jesus, right? I want to do that too. It's Jesus everywhere. There's churches all over the place in Israel. You just can't get rid of Jesus and churches throughout the entire world now. And so they hoped they had gotten rid of Jesus when they killed him. And now they hope to get rid of Jesus by shutting down Peter and John. And if they shut them down, do you, guys, do you guys realize if they shut them down, that the church would actually not be here today? If they shut down Peter and John, everything actually hinges 
on these two lowlifes, right? These two fishermen, these two preachers from Galilee, and how they were to deal with the persecution that they were dealing with in Acts chapter 4. And boy, oh boy, we are so glad that they did a good job, right? Because we wouldn't be here if they didn't preach Christ to the Sanhedrin, and they shut down. And they could have just said, you know what, let's play it cool and get out of here. But no, they were very strong and they were very courageous. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Wow. Wow. What a moment, right? Right in the face of you. You're the Supreme Court right here. You guys are the Jewish leaders. You're supposed to be teaching us about God. So you judge this. Is it right to listen to you or God? God help them. Right? Because if they say, listen to God, then they're stuck, right? But if they say, Listen to men, then they just threw God under the bus. And these guys are the, the leaders of our religion. So they're just stuck, once again, between a rock and a hard place. Plus, Peter and John just basically set in front of them that you guys are on the polar side, right? Should we listen to you over here, or should we listen to God? And once again, separating them from God when they thought they were the closest to God. And they stick it out right in front of them with holy courage because they cannot deny what they have seen and what they have heard. And so Peter and John just stand right there firm in the truth and they leverage a higher court of authority. Who is it? They leverage God, don't they? But doesn't it say that we're supposed to Submit to the governing authorities in Romans chapter 13? Doesn't it say in 1 Peter 2 that we're supposed to submit to the kings and the governors who rule over us? Of course, yeah, of course. Until it comes down to a conflict between a higher command from God, isn't it? And that is when it's a totally different story. And I just want to say there are so many times in the Bible where disobedience actually comes into play. I'm talking specifically disobedience to men, not God, okay? Remember Daniel? The king told Daniel, you know what? We got a new edict here. You can't pray anymore, right? You can't pray to God. You're supposed to pray to me. And what did Daniel do? He prayed to God. He didn't care. Exodus 1. Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm a new Pharaoh here. We forgot who Joseph was. I'm going to kill every single new Hebrew baby. In Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 1, it says, The midwives feared God, and they let the boys live. Hence why we got Moses, which is so important, right? Somebody may come along and say to you, Don't preach Christ. What does the Bible say? Preach Christ. Preach Christ till you die. Somebody might come along and say, You know what? You can't worship God anymore. What does the Bible say? On the Lord's day, come and worship God. Do not forsake the fellowship. Somebody may come along and say, you know what? You need to accept the LGBTQ community. What does the Bible say? Preach to them, right? That's a sin. Preach against it. They, yes, repent and come and don't, don't do that anymore. But we got to preach. Peter and John knew that they were supposed to be subject to the authorities above them, of course. But, and the thing is, I have to just remind us all that Christians, when you look at a Christian, you should see the finest citizen that you ever see, right? Christians should be the finest citizens. But at the same time, when anything comes to the violating, violation of the commands of Scripture, who do we go with? God. Right? All the time. We go with God. We obey Christ rather than the government. And we saw this with COVID, didn't we? We saw this where there was a restriction against the churches, especially in California. And the church did shut down for the first couple of months. And our church did shut down for the first couple of months. Until finally we realized, you know what? COVID wasn't what it was supposed to be. 
You know, like, I, don't, I didn't see millions of people just falling like it was some kind of zombie pandemic or something like that. It's not what it, it's supposed to be, but the government is still pushing it. And so all of a sudden the church says, you know what? We, we got to um, worship. We got to come and worship. We, we, can't, we can't disregard the Lord's Supper anymore. Uh, we can't disregard the Lord's command to come during the, the Lord's Day and worship. We got to encourage the brothers. Everyone is, is suicidal in their worship right now, but we need food spiritual food and so we came and we reopened and many churches reopened in defiance to the, the tyranny of the government forcing us to disobey God and listen to man therefore we opened up and so we must see that there comes an appointed time when you must obey God rather than men and if you do that you will be persecuted the church is still being persecuted. If you take a look at Canada, their COVID restrictions are still going on and church pastors are being jailed at the very moment. I'm surprised that it's not coming to uh, America here. But it is in North America at the very least, right? And, but here we are with Peter and John and they're obedient at all costs. And they're calling us to be obedient at all costs. And like oh, Paul says, woe to me if I don't preach, right? Cursed is me if I don't preach. I can't do anything else but speak the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ. May that be your words too then. You don't ever want to stop doing what you're doing just because you're getting persecuted. That's not what God calls us to do. It wasn't the persecution, if you guys know my story, that caused me to leave my church. I, I actually invited it. I liked the persecution in a weird way because I actually saw the purification of the church. I saw who was right and who was wrong. I saw who was sheep and who was goat and who was wolves. And I said, okay, this is good. You know, this is dividing the church correctly. And I saw the blessings of the maturity in believers. And some of you guys are here because of that. And I, I, I bless you guys. No false accusations, charges against you, threats, mental or physical abuse, chains or imprisonment should ever make us violate the commands of Scripture. We are called to stand firm in all cases, right? To live as Christ, to die as gain. doesn't matter. Now, a great example of this is from the early church father, Chrysostom, and he was summoned in front of the Roman emperor, Arcadius, and he was threatened that if he kept preaching the gospel, quote, if you do not cease to preach Jesus, you will be banished, he says. And to which Christensen replied, You cannot banish me, for the world is my father's house. Then I will slay you instead. No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ and God. Your treasures will be confiscated. Sire, that cannot be, for my treasures are in heaven, where none can break through and steal. Then I will drive you from men, and you will have no friends. That you cannot do either. For I have a friend in heaven who has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing broke his spirit. No threat caused him to leave and disobey God. Therefore, when handling persecution, you must be obedient at all costs. Principle number five, I'm going to go a little bit quicker, is be united. We need to be united, or it actually brings you to unity. Verse 21 and 22. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. Interesting. On account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. Verse 22. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So there's where we get his age. Traditionally, he's probably been doing this for around 40 years then. And so what we see right here from the Sanhedrin, the response was that it was all political, right? Let's do this for the sake of the people because they're all glorifying God. And all the men glorify God. Why? Because this man was, I said, 40 years old, verifiable healing. And so what happened to Peter and John? They were let go. They were let go, praise God. And, but after threatening them, it doesn't break them at all. They were still very obedient. So... After they were let go, what happened? Verse 23. When they, have been, when they had been released, they went to their own companions or friends 
and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So after the persecution, they went back to their friends. They were reunited and united even stronger. That's what persecution does, doesn't it? It brings us even closer than before because we had just experienced something together and we came out victorious, didn't we? And we often talk about church unity all the time. We said the church needs to be unified in doctrine and faith and all that kind of stuff. And we often overlook the fact that persecution is such an important factor to our unity, isn't it? Oftentimes we see Christians so tied up in these little useless things. You know, what are we going to do tomorrow? You know, what, are, what kind of food are we going to plan? Or, you know, let's get together, let's do a fundraiser, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. We say that too, by the way. We get involved in these things that don't matter too much, right? It doesn't really matter too much. But if, listen, if we are really, really a Christian or doing the Christian things and confronting the world, we would get so much heat that we would not have time to really mess around because we would be driven together for our common love and bearing each other's burdens, equipping each other, securing the body for the next round of war, right? And ultimately, this persecution, this war that we're meeting, would actually bind us together and build our unity. But as of now, we see that the church isn't really confronting the world anymore, right? And there isn't this like trouble that causes you and I to really need each other anymore. So we're kind of stuck in our own Zoom place, aren't we? But the church was persecuted back then, and it actually bounded them together. Principle number six. You should bless the Lord when handling persecution. You should bless the Lord. So bless the Lord. Verse 24. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. That's amazing, isn't it? Instead of being all depressed and being, oh, I got hurt, you know, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bless Him. I, they acknowledge that, God, you are in this, aren't you? You're the one that did this. Praise the Lord. They didn't come back all beaten. They came back all rejoicing and said, look what happened to us, you know? Yes. Awesome, right? They were able to preach Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And plus, they were even able to preach to the Sanhedrin. What a world, right? What an experience. What more can you ask for? They could have came back with an attitude that said, like, better a live chicken than a dead lion. You know, at least we're still alive. But instead, Peter and John was like who? Joshua and Caleb, right? They said, you know what? We can, we can take this. You know, we can do it. And all the other people were like, no, we're, we're scared of all these giants over there. They were just like them. Let's do this. And they even praised God by quoting Psalm chapter 2. And that's in verse 25 and further. And it says this. Whom, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered against, uh, together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his Christ. And what's important here to note is that even clear back in Psalm chapter 2, it prophesied that the world would go against their anointed one, right? That's what David just said right here. That the world would go against their Christ, and their Christ, our Christ, is being persecuted, would get persecuted. Verse 27 28. For truly, in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both uh, you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purposes predestined to occur. Amazing. Amazing verse. It's all the plans of God. That's what he said. All predestined in the first place. They gave it their best shot in front of Herod, in front of Pontius Pilate, in front of all these Gentiles. And what did it accomplish? Salvation, right? It accomplished salvation through his death. Salvation 
Cain, another example of Satan just overdoing himself, overshooting and benefiting us. Just like in the story of Joseph, what was meant for evil, God meant it for good. Seventh and last principle. Pray <clears throat> for greater boldness. Pray for greater boldness. Does this mean that there's more persecution? You better believe it, right? Verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They were ready to get back and go at it once again. But they told us not to do it. Well, that's why you need to pray, right? Pray that they are empowered, like it says in verse 30. And so therefore they did pray. And they didn't really pray that their enemies be on their, the, the neck of their footstool. You know, they didn't pray that their enemies be destroyed. Why? Because it was too good, right? They were like, why ruin the joy? You opened up the opportunities, Lord. You, we just saw 5,000 men plus women and children saved. We're okay with dying if that's the case. If this keeps going on and if your kingdom has progressed, we just pray that you just empower us. Right? Don't pray to destroy the enemies. They're not looking for it now. They're actually looking for an end. So that's why they pray for a greater boldness next time. Right? More confidence. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, watch this, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with Boldness. That's a powerful prayer, right? Can you imagine you're praying and the whole place just starts shaking? And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak the Word of God with boldness and they just flew right out there again, right? Just doing the same exact thing. Let's go. Let's go back and preach. And verse 32 says this, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Back to that unity again, right? Back to that boldness of being unified of what they actually do together. People were getting saved left and right. It doesn't really tell us the amount anymore. I think it was just uncountable. We already know it's around 20,000 people. and It's too big. They, they don't have big places, to uh, coliseums to hold everyone. They're just all over the place, right? Un, there's, no consent, there's no census anymore. And they asked God for more power to do God's will. And God answered them. And this could be you and this could be me if you live a godly life you know some of you guys will never experience this because you will never commit your life to a godly life you, pro you profess Christianity but you're actually not doing the mission you're not actually living it out you may never experience persecution you may never see the blessings that comes through persecution while some of you guys will attempt to live a godly life but when persecution comes, you crumble. And that's it. It just stops right there and it sizzles down. And a few of you guys will actually live a godly life. And you'll suffer persecution. And in the midst of it, you'll submit to it. You'll be spirit-filled. You'll seize the opportunity to preach the gospel. You'll be obedient at all costs. And you'll bless the Lord and continue to grow in your faith because you have experienced the glory of God and you have seen and tasted the reward and you are just simply at joy. And so may this sermon convict you to be that few people who live a guy life and do the mission of God. Let us pray. Our Lord and Savior, what a wonderful thing it is to see the blessings that comes when we preach your name. Lord, in this day and age, we are so scared. There's so much cancer culture going on. We know that the, our, our government is not in the right. It's actually persecuting Christians for speaking truth. It seems like truth is all blurry, but Lord, we know that truth is not. It's, it's plain and simple, right in your word. And your word tells us to preach it, to stand firm, to be a light in all the darkness around us, Lord. And may we see that when we do meet persecution for being faithful, may we not run away. 
May we be bold like Peter and John and see their example and see what comes out of it, Lord. We thank you for this message from them, and we pray that this will seep in our hearts and we will remember when the day comes. In your name, amen.